Today we're going to be learning about streams and floods. And as usual, I'm starting with a uh, hazard map, although this isn't exactly a hazard map as much as a um, result of uh, flooding. What we're looking at are presidential disaster declarations related to flooding in the United States shown by county. You can see green areas represent one declaration, yellow are two, orange are uh, three, and red are four or more that, uh, of these presidential disaster declarations between 1965 and 2003. So what this tells us is you're screwed in California. Um, well, no, what this actually is showing is places where we have populations that are prone to having floods and bad floods that require a disaster declaration. So you see a lot here in the Gulf Coast, a lot in the Mississippi Valley. Um, now, here in Nevada, you see a lot of places where there were no declarations. Now, it's not that there haven't been any floods there. But a lot of Nevada is actually military bases and desert, where no one lives there. So uh, even if a really big flood happens, you don't get a, a disaster declaration. So while this does give us an idea of who's at risk and who has experienced a lot of flooding, it's not a perfect picture of things, but it does give us a little idea. So when we're talking about flooding along rivers, well, first we need to get a, an idea, a picture of how rivers work. And uh, for a geologist, we use this term stream for any surface water that flows in a confined channel. Uh, it does, there's no size to this, so this could be everything from a, a Lull Creek somewhere to the Amazon River. Um, but it's surface water, it's flowing, means it's moving, and it's in a confined channel. There's a specific place where it is supposed to fl flow. When it is out of that channel, that's when we have a flood. Now, when we're looking at streams and floods, it's important to know your stream's drainage basin. This is the geographic area drained by a river and its tributaries. Great example right here is the Mississippi River drainage basin. So the Mississippi flows right here, but the drainage basin, well, there's all of these tributaries, which are smaller streams flowing into that main river. The water entering the Mississippi River can come all the way from over here in Pennsylvania or up here in actually Canada. And we need to know that drainage basin because you could be living somewhere down here and have a flood, even though it's not raining where you are. It's beautiful and sunny. Well, why could you have that? Maybe there's a big storm system parked up here, and because the river gets the water from there, it all flows downstream. So to really understand your floods, you want to understand your entire river system, including that drainage basin where all the water is coming from. All right, other characteristics of streams that uh, we look at are the gradient, this is the slope of the stream channel, and that can affect how fast the water is flowing. And how fast the water is flowing is the velocity. Now, I said the velocity is going to be affected by the slope. It's also affected by where exactly we are in the stream. So here's a nice block diagram of a straight stream. And the maximum velocity, the fastest water flow, is right there in the center part of the stream. Now, oh, why is that? It's because the um, channel, the edges of the channel, exert friction on the water and hold the water back, slow it down a little bit. So it's going to be slower at the edges of the stream and on uh, where the stream is touching the bottom of the channel, and it's going to be fastest in the center part of the stream. Now this changes a little bit if we look at a stream where there are curves in it. When the stream has curves in it, it actually pushes the maximum velocity to the outside part of the curve, and it's going to be slowest at the inside of the curve. And so what this ends up doing is it causes erosion to occur at the outside, 
and deposition at the inside of the kerf because there's a rule with streams. When water is flowing fast, it can, has energy and it can pick up sediment, it can erode, and when water is flowing slow, it drops off whatever sediment it's carrying. And so we end up getting what's called a cut bank right there at the outside of the curve where erosion is happening, and then we have what's called a point bar, the inside of the curve where the water is slower and it is dropping off sediment. Now another aspect, another characteristic of a stream is the discharge. And this can be very variable depending on uh, the weather patterns of the time. And this is the volume of water flowing past a certain point on a stream. So uh, the discharge is measured at different parts of the stream and they have these stream flow gauges and those record how much water is flowing Ooh, I almost had a sneeze. How much water is flowing past the stream flow gauge every second? And so this is going to be measured in cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second. Uh, there is a stream flow gauge near campus. If you drive on Gosling Road, there's uh, that bridge that goes over the place that floods every time it rains. There's a silver box at one end of the bridge that uh, is actually con uh, goes to a stream flow gauge under the bridge. So they're measuring how much water flows past there. All right, so these streams, they... Um, they start in an area called the headwaters, that's where a stream begins, and then they flow to a certain point where they reach the end of the stream. And when the stream ends, it can create landforms because it's going to deposit the sediment that it's carrying. So let's take a look at these depositional landforms created at the end of a stream. We can have a delta and the delta forms where a stream enters a standing body of water, like a lake or the ocean. In lakes and oceans, we don't have this constant flow like we do in the stream, so it's lower energy. Remember I said lower energy, everything gets dropped off. Now the classic delta is the Nile Delta. We see the Nile flowing along there, and then we see this nice triangular shape there. That's the delta. Now, how it got its name goes all the way back to an ancient Greek, I think it was Herodotus, uh, who saw that these look like triangles, and the Greek letter that is a triangle is delta. So that's where it got its name from. Now, why does that triangular shape develop? Because the water is flowing and drops off its sediment, it's going to kind of clog up that pathway, so then the stream will move a little bit and deposit sediment there until it deposits so much it kind of blocks that pathway, so then the stream will move again, and so it's constantly trying to find the easiest pathway to the ocean, so it's kind of moving around there, spreading that sediment into that triangular pattern. Now sometimes, especially in arid climates and in uh, deserts, mountainous deserts, you um, get alluvial fans developing where a stream ends. So what happens is you get a stream flowing from the mountains into a flat valley. And uh, well, in the mountains, steep gradient, it's flowing nice and fast, then that river hits that flat valley, it slows down, and it drops all its sediment. And it's going to create this pile of sediment at the base of the mountains, like what we see here. Now, these streams, uh, this is Death Valley, they are what's called ephemeral, it means they're not always flowing. These usually only flow if we have a rainstorm in that area or sometimes in spring when the snow is melting from the mountains. So the stream comes out there and then out here is the valley, right? It hits that flat valley, slows down, drops its sediment, and just like the river or uh, uh, going into the ocean, it's trying to find the easiest pathway and so it, it, uh, it's constantly moving its channel, finding that easiest pathway, distributing that sediment in that kind of fan shape there. 
These things can be quite large. This is again in Death Valley, and stream comes out of the mountains there. This is the alluvial fan. Give you an idea of size, that is a full-size pickup truck right there. So that's uh, a pretty big um, landform that can be created. Now a little more about the behavior of streams and the erosion and deposition that they cause. We need to understand what base level is. And base level is the lowest point to which a stream can erode its channel. Like the goal of streams is to erode the landscape. They, streams really want to just carve away the landscape and make everything flat. And they want to carve everything down to base level. And you can have local base level. Local lake base level could be a lake, it could be a very resistant rock formation that the stream just can't carve through, could be another stream. That's a local base level. So for example, here's the headwaters of the Rio Grande, and flows along here and flows into the Gulf of Mexico. This is the, oh, which river is that? That is the Pecos. So the Pecos River has a local base level right there. Whatever that elevation where it flows into the Rio Grande, that's its local base level. The Pecos River cannot carve any lower than that elevation. So remember, water flows downhill. It can't carve lower than that, or suddenly the Rio Grande is going to be flowing that way um, uh, on the Pecos. So that's a local base level. But all rivers ultimately want to get to ultimate base level. Well, what's ultimate base level? Where's the Rio Grande ultimately want to go? To sea level. And so sea level is ultimate base level. This is uh, one of these confluences where two rivers come together and uh, this river will not carve any lower than that other river. And like I said, ultimate base level is sea level. So if all rivers had their way, I know I'm personifying rivers, but if they all had their way, they would carve the landscape flat down to sea level. And uh, so local base levels, ultimate base level. All right, now there are different types of streams that exist. And um, if you decide you want to become a geologist, you might even take a class called fluvial geology. Fluvial geology, well, fluvial is the fancy word for rivers. So if you take this class, fluvial geology, well, that's going to be an entire semester long class just on rivers and how they work. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to you know, cram in an entire semester uh, into one lecture. Uh, so we're just going to look at two very specific types of streams and see how they're different and why they're different, just to give you a flavor of uh, the, the fact that streams can behave in very different ways. We're going to start with our meandering stream. Well, the word meander means to kind of wander about aimlessly. And that's what meandering streams do. Notice it kind of wanders over this way, and then back this way, and then back this way. They, they sort of, you know, wander about. The uh, characteristics of a meandering stream is they have a single sinuous channel. A well, single channel means there's one channel, one place where the water's flowing. Sinuous means it's really, really curvy. These tend to occur near base level. So near base level, um, the stream still has energy, but it's not focusing that energy on carving downwards anymore. So that energy gets focused on kind of moving from side to side. And that's why we get these meandering streams close to base level. And the channels on these are always shifting. To give you an idea of how much they shift, this is part of the Mississippi River right near the border between Tennessee, Kentucky, and uh, Missouri. And the modern Mississippi is right here in that color. 
and all the different colors show the path of the Mississippi over the past something like, uh, I don't know, uh, 2,000 years, something like that. And it just shows you that sometimes this river was flowing that way. Sometimes it came all the way out here. Now, it, in the past, it was once over there. And right now, it's right here. So these are constantly moving and shifting around. And these meandering streams have parts to them. So this is a basic block diagram. We took a block of Earth's crust and we're looking at this stream and it's definitely meandering, right? And we call one of these like curvy things right there a meander loop. And um, the reason these meandering streams move, remember that whole cut bank and point bar I was talking about? The cut bank is the outside part of the curve. The point bar is the inside where the stream is flowing slower and depositing. So these meander loops are always sort of being pushed around by that erosion and deposition. And so every now and then, See how this would be the outside part of that loop? It will erode and it'll connect those two and it'll leave one of these meander loops cut off. It won't be part of the stream anymore. When that happens, we call it an oxbow. And that's one of those cut off uh, meander loops um, because the stream straightened itself out due to that never ending erosion and deposition that's occurring. Uh, over time, with this meandering stream wandering back and forth, it, you get this flat area um, uh, created, and that is the area that's going to flood first, and we call that the floodplain. And so those are kind of your parts of the meandering stream, the meander loops, the cut bank, the point bar, the oxbow, and uh, the floodplain. What we're seeing right here is notice that in some areas we have sediment that's being deposited and in some areas we have that cut bank that's eroded, right? Because the stream is kind of curving around. The outside of the curve is where erosion happens. The inside of the curve is where deposition happens. And then in this illustration, what we're seeing is a really nice floodplain. Notice how we drop down here there's this flat area where the stream is flowing, and then we go back up there. So the floodplains, this flat area between those two hills. Now that's a meandering stream, and uh, around this part of the world you'll actually see a number of meandering streams because we're relatively close to sea level, right? Close to base level. In other areas, you tend to get what's called a braided stream. It's very different characteristics because in this case, you have multiple channels. You don't just have this one meandering sinuous channel. You have multiple channels. It's called a braided stream because those channels, they kind of split apart and then they come back together and they split apart and come together. And separating them are going to be these piles of sediment. So this is a braided stream. Notice we have a channel here. We have one that kind of comes over here. We have one that's flowing over there. Of course, in a flood, this whole thing, all of this would fill with water. But in normal times, we have these separated channels. Now, these tend to occur where there's more sediment available than the stream can carry. That's why you get those piles of sediment separating the different multiple channels. Well, what kinds of environments do we have that uh, you get lots and lots of sediment uh, and not that much water to move it? Well, these are common in deserts and in glacial areas. So in deserts, you just don't have a lot of water. Uh, and, but you might be thinking, why do we get braided streams in glacial areas? There should be plenty of water. I mean, glaciers are nothing but frozen water, right? Well, glaciers are very good at grinding up the rock underneath them, so they produce a lot of sediment. So often there will be more sediment created by that glacier than what the streams can carry. And so you end up with these very nice braided streams in glacial environments where we have these multiple channels. Again, we 
have a channel here, we have one there, we have one all the way over there, separated by those piles of sediment. And so those are just two examples of the types of different streams that we can have occurring on Earth.